Hi, it's Nick Malloy. Welcome to episode two of An Evil Mind. Um, and no, I didn't shave this morning because obviously I'm riding the rails. Um, what we're going to talk about this week is Sherlock Holmes, as promised last week. Um, short version, why should you care about Sherlock Holmes? There is, quite simply, no other author than Arthur Conan Doyle and no other character than Sherlock Holmes in modern crime fiction that has had as great an influence. Um, it, 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 it's, it's inestimable. I think that's probably the best word for it. Uh, 56 short stories, four novels, and um, they're not all gems. <laughs> we'll get to that. So we're going to tell you, uh, you know, what are probably, what's the good stuff. Um, first, we got to start with, as we mentioned in the last episode, the very first home story, which is A Study in Scarlet. Um, you know, a mutated version of this was done as the first episode of the, uh, the BBC Sherlock Holmes with Cumberbatch and uh, Guy from the Office, blank his name, Martin Freeman. Um, as I said before, it's, it's a very economical introduction to the character. Remember, you know, what I didn't mention last time is how much setup they did. Um, you know, just the first few pages of the story, Watson gives out his backstory. Uh, he's recently returned from Afghanistan. He's been wounded. Um, and he's looking for a new place to live because he's running through his money. So he's running through, you know, all, all the cash that the, uh, the British Army has given him in his convalescence. Runs into an old friend of his from school. And this guy says, oh, well, I know somebody else who's looking for a room. It's another guy with no money. His name's Sherlock Holmes, but you might not like him because he's a weirdo. And then he goes on to list some things that are weird about Holmes, such as uh, Holmes beating cadavers in the college, uh, the med medical school morgue with a stick to see how long after death bruises might be inflicted. So that tells us something right there, that not only is Holmes, yes, weird, but he's doing genuine research. He's actually working towards what we would consider in, in modern era, criminalistics, CSI stuff. Um, so they meet, and as I said last episode, first thing out of Holmes' mouth to Watson is, you have been in Afghanistan, I perceive. And he's right, of course. No way he knows it, except that his massive attention to detail and his capacity for deductive reasoning allows him to zap through the chain super fast, and he comes to this conclusion. He is, of course, right. Holmes is almost always right in the conclusions that he makes about his perceptions. Now, th these do not always give him the solution to the mystery, but it's a, it, it's a neat trick. It's something that really no other character up to that point had been able to do. Uh, certainly, you know, not Dupas, not uh, Lecoq, uh, who were probably, you know, the, the predecessor and contemporary of Holmes, respectively. So, what happens in the study of Scarlet is uh, there's, a, there's a guy found dead in an abandoned house. Uh, there's a golden ring on the floor next to him. Blood all over the place, although this guy does not have any wounds upon him. And written above him are the letters R-A-C-H-E. Could be the beginning of the name Rachel, suggesting that a woman is involved. Could be uh, the word in German for revenge. So, obviously, the London cops figure, uh, we got anarchists involved in this. Holmes is not so sure. Holmes is, of course, right. And I don't want to ruin the ending for you. We're going to run into this a lot. As far as a pure mystery goes, Study in Scarlet actually plays pretty fair. You, the reader, see everything that Holmes sees. And you could, you could reasonably draw the same inferences from that information that Holmes does. you got a reasonable shot at solving the mystery, coming to the same conclusions that he did. He does, of course, uh, find the guy responsible. There's a heck of a lot more to it. German anarchists have nothing to do with it. But um, what I do need to warn you about with Study in Scarlet is what I call the Mormon interlude. So the entire backstory uh, for the perpetrator, for the murderer, for you know the reason why all of this stuff happened in the first place 
occurs in Utah in 1880s. Um, it's it's boring. I I cannot recommend that frequently. When I reread it, I skip over it a lot of the time. Um, I wish I could say something better for it. But probably a good place to mention that any uh, opinions expressed herein are solely mine. Uh, because this is the sort of thing like real Holmes fans would jump in me with both feet about. And uh, nothing to be done for it. I think the Mormon stuff's a drag. Um, accounts vary as to later if Arthur Conan Doyle sort of uh, repented, so to speak, for the portrait that he painted of Western Mormonism out here in the out here in uh, nature. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't think he really needs to, but he, he did not paint a flattering portrait of the religion and the culture. So what we want to move on to next is three years later, he comes out with The Sign of Four. And that's my jam. It may be one of my favorite home stories. Okay, Sign of Four. Starts off as a locked room mystery. Um, you know, a, a woman comes to Holmes and Watson to ask their advice. She's been getting, uh, you know, jewelry in the mail and a letter that she has been uh, wrongly treated and that a fortune that is partly hers uh, shall be hers. Uh, so they go to the home of the Sholto brothers, and one of whom is the person who has been sending the jewelry and the letters. And unfortunately, the other Sholto brother is murdered in what is apparently a locked room mystery. Holmes, of course, gets a decent handle on it right out of the gate, but he doesn't have all the pieces. And after that, the story really becomes more uh, a Victorian adventure story. Uh, you know, there is, there's no way to put this. There is a racist caricature of, of an islander. Um, you know, that some of the uh, colonial sins of Great Britain come home to London. Um and there's, you know, a, a very, uh, it, it sounds funny, but there is a thrilling steamboat chase along the Thames. And it, it actually really does work well. It, it's rendered greatly. Um, so, you know, there is an element of mystery. And you know, like I said about Study of Scarlet, uh, Sign of the Four, Sign of Four, rather, doesn't play as fair. Um, you know, you, you're not probably going to figure out exactly how it happened except by following Holmes and Watson along. So it's not as pure a mystery. It really is more of an adventure story. One uh, thing that definitely comes out of it is that uh, Watson gets his either first wife or only wife. And the problem is this introduces the first of what are going to be many continuity problems in the course of the Holmes stories. Um, again, let me reiterate, there were 50 six home stories and four novels over a period of almost 30 years. Uh, Doyle is not the most observant guy continuity wise, but that's a matter for self-appointed academics. And there are home super fans out there and some of them may watch it and some of them may uh, not be happy with me and they worry way too much about the stuff. You know, should Doyle have paid more attention? Yeah, he should have, but you know, I don't have time. I don't have time to bust the guy's chops about it as, as a writer myself. Um, you know, I wouldn't do it. I'd be more careful. On the other hand, I was not working at the furious pace for the next almost two and a half years. Uh, Doyle puts out like a story a month, and his quality level is real strong over that period. Um, you know, later on, you can see. You know, obviously, he starts to lose interest. And the way we can tell mainly that he lost interest is he kills Holmes off in The Adventure of the Final Problem. Um, you've seen a version of this dramatized, if nothing else, recently on, on the Cumberbatch show. Um, this is the one where Professor Moriarty, Holmes' arch enemy, who we actually have heard about a little bit as the stories go. He, he's not introduced in The Final Problem. He, he appears on stage, as it were, for the first time in The Final Problem, but he has been referred to before that, and him and Holmes have their final showdown over the Reichenbach Falls, and apparently they both died. Well, of course, they didn't, and um, it took 
I believe, seven years uh, for Holmes to be brought back by Doyle. And this only after massive public pressure. I can't really overstate this. The only real precedent for Doyle as, as, as a literary phenomenon in his era is Charles Dickens. Um, I, the reason he's he's banging these stories out like this is because the demand for them becomes almost insatiable in Victorian England and in the United States. Um, you know, like Dickens, Doyle is also subject to an enormous amount of copyright infringement in the U.S. Uh, he gets pirated almost instantly. Okay, so let's sum up. Uh, the stories as a whole... Um, read much better today than say the Poe does. The language in the home stories is fairly close to what we would recognize as modern English or at least modern British English. So they're easier reading. Um, they're you know less concerned with being clever than the Poe stories. Um, as far as you know Holmes if you see modern renditions of Holmes and I'm not even counting adaptations of the, of the old stories, direct adaptations, He's recognizable. Um, they didn't have the term on the spectrum back then, but you will recognize that. And you, what I've often thought of from the stories is that how, where Holmes is on the spectrum is something of a pose. Not entirely, not a, not 100%. His personality in the stories is actually much more malleable than it's represented as being in modern versions. Um, you know, yeah, he's weird about women. Um, possibly, it's definitely in the in the stories to the point of being misogynist, but he's capable of being charming. He's capable of being flirtatious. At one point, I mean, you know, he goes out in in one of his disguises. And that element persists into the modern realm, uh, and ends up getting himself engaged to someone's maid in the course of about three days. Now, yeah, okay, Victorian England, things moved. A little differently romance wise than they do now uh, but still that means you know when Holmes wishes uh, to be a nice guy he is certainly capable of it and and it's not a hundred percent a pose uh, when he decides to he's certainly capable of, of general courtesy so with that said do you need to read all the stories no, you don't. There, there's a hell of a lot of them, and that's even that's just the official canon. So, you know, where do you get off the bus if you decide you need to? Well, it, that could come as easily as, you know, after you read a study in Scarlet, and I would recommend starting with that and reading the stories chronologically. Um, you know, if you decide you don't like that, it's not for you. Fine. You know, I'm a pretty big fan. I'll read all of them, but um, you know, like I said, I, I do kind of flag some toward the far end of the canon. You definitely, I would say, read the first two years worth of story, which is about 24 stories and two of the novels. And then, of course, read Hound of the Baskervilles. I'm sure you've seen it adapted. There's not going to be a lot of surprises there for you, but it's good to read in the telling. These are very uh, well-written books, like I said, recognizably modern in their conventions and language there's some you know some language weirdness just by virtue of them being 120 130 years old not a heck of a lot of that um but you know if you get to the final problem you're okay you don't have to go on beyond that unless at that point you have been converted and you are a big fan and if you are and go all the way to the end, which is his last bow, and that uh, takes place right before World War I. This turned out to be uh, one of what I'm eventually going to call our author spotlight episodes. It, you know, um, I try to keep these things under 10 minutes, so um, you know, I wouldn't go into this in the, in the same kind of detail that, I, that I'd really like to, certainly the kind of detail it deserves. That said, again, if you become a big fan, there is no shortage of nonfiction Holmes scholarship, biographies of Arthur Conan Doyle. And he was an interesting guy in some ways, a very strange guy. Um, you know, and then, of course, a million reimaginings of Holmes, a million stories that other people have written that take place in the era. There are supernatural, you know, Sherlock Holmes fights Dracula, Sherlock Holmes, there's a whole anthology of Sherlock Holmes gets into, into H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos. There's all that kind of stuff. 
So there's plenty of stuff out there. If you're a really big homes person, if you become that, um, you are never going to read, run out of things to read. Uh, you know, recent uh, material in that vein, I would recommend Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's novel about Sherlock's brother, Mycroft. Actually, surprisingly good. Um, so I would recommend that, actually, pretty wholeheartedly. So we're going to be back in about a week or so. Again, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll answer them in the comments. We did that with the first one. Uh, you know, you can follow us on social media. Uh, please follow the links down below to read more, to get the books, to get related books, to get, uh, you know, my books for that matter. And uh, thank you again very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Alrighty, bye.